Well, hi all. If you notice, everything's quite a bit different, isn't it? I moved my studio from the garage because I just could not handle the Texas heat again for another summer. I did last summer, you know, where 100 degree temperatures again and again and again with no air conditioning. I mean, I was out there just, <laughs> it was brutal. And so I've moved the whole studio into my study here, which is a pretty cramped little room. And I'm just trying to get it fixed up nice. And, you know, let me know what you think. And uh, I don't know what the sound's going to be like. I have no idea. We're going to get that all ironed out as we move along. It's going to get better and better. But right now, this is what it is. So we're continuing our study in the Gospel of Mark and our look at the temptation of Christ. Well, let's read our passage, Mark 1, 12 through 13. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, last time we spent our time clearing out some misunderstandings about the different ways we can face temptation. This time we'll get into the first of three temptations. But first, I think it's important to see the timing of all this. Notice how Jesus is being tempted right after the blessing of being baptized. And that's a pattern we should be aware of. And so let's look at that, the pattern. Blessing followed by battle. The blessing, that's in Mark 1, 9 through 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Wow, fantastic. But now the battle, Mark 1, 12 through 13. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. So immediately after being blessed, affirmed and empowered, you think it would say, and Jesus entered the best season of his life Empowered by the Holy Spirit, he enjoyed amazing success in his earthly ministry and in everything. It all got so much easier. But no, things got harder. There is an immediate increase in warfare and an immediate attack. But I've noticed in my life this seems to be the norm. After great blessings, there will be spiritual battles. Things like fighting depression are increased temptation. See, after we're blessed, the enemy wants to steal our joy and redirect our focus from God. I mean, he can't have a bunch of joy-filled worshipers walking around in the midst of his lied-to people. People like that have infectious joy. They're dangerous to his kingdom, so he has to do whatever he can to stop it. Now, do you see this pattern of blessing followed by battle in other scriptures? Yeah, and it starts all the way back in Genesis. In Genesis, we see God moving in glorious creation power and then joyfully proclaiming it is very good. But right after that blessing is the battle. We find Satan in the garden tempting Adam and Eve. Then in Mark 9, there is the mountaintop experience where Peter, James, and John see Jesus in glory with Moses and Elijah. I mean, wow, right? But they come down to a demon too powerful for the disciples to defeat. There's war. Then in Ephesians, the first chapters are filled with so much blessing, incredible theology, such as we're chosen by God and adopted through Christ. We're sealed with the Spirit who guarantees our eternity. But then chapter 6, war. We see that the Christian life is not going to be easy. We see when we were called into salvation, we weren't called into the comfort zone, but onto a battlefield. So we are told our Christian walk will include blessing, but also wrestling with satanic powers that want to destroy us. Therefore, we are to put on the whole armor of God so we will be able to stand. So here we see Jesus blessed, affirmed, and empowered at his baptism, then immediately attacked. And one more thing I want to point out, these attacks came from a very real enemy. Now, I bring that up because many who claim to believe in God don't believe in a real devil. They think he's a myth. A cartoon character man created or just a symbol that represents evil and rebellion. But we see in the temptation of Jesus that Satan is not a myth, not just a symbol of evil. Jesus is contending with a very real individual who hates God and all who belong to him, one who actively opposes God's work on earth and in our lives. So battle after blessing is typical 
and that battle is with a very real, very personal enemy. So keep your spiritual armor on and trust God and his promises and you will stand. But now, have you ever wondered why God who is sovereign would even allow this? I mean, he doesn't have to, right? He can make sure it is just blessing upon blessing upon blessing with no warfare in between. Well, let's see if we can figure that one out. Here it is. He allows it because it's necessary for our spiritual development. These battles, rather than destroying us, actually aid in our growth. And that brings us to our next point, the necessity of the battle. Mark 1, 12 and 13, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. Now notice that it's the Spirit who drove him into the wilderness where he would be tempted. And that tells us there is a divine purpose in this. Now, I can hear some of the objections, but doesn't Scripture say in James 1.13, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Well, that's right, isn't it? God will never tempt us. But you know what he will do? He will use Satan's temptations to develop us. And we'll see that is what's happening with Jesus. The temptation he faces is going to make him more effective. Now, I know that might sound a bit strange, but we'll see how it works in a moment. But first, let's examine the word used for tempt. It's an interesting one with two possible meanings. It's paranzo in the Greek, and it can be translated as tempt, but also as test. So in these same circumstances, Jesus is going to experience both. He will be tested and he will be tempted. God will be testing him for good purposes, while the devil wants to use these same circumstances to try and destroy him. And it's true with us too, isn't it? When we are tempted, both of those things are always happening. But what is God doing here in this temptation of Jesus? What is this testing meant to accomplish? Well, let me point out two things. First, God is using this test to prove something, that Jesus is the Messiah the Jews were waiting for. The Old Testament said the Messiah would listen to God's word and submit to it. And here we see Jesus doing exactly that. Even in the midst of this intense temptation where the devil is trying to use a legitimate need to cause him not to listen to God or submit to him. Second, God would also be using these circumstances to develop Jesus. Now, I know that sounds strange. I mean, isn't Jesus God? So isn't he already perfect? What can be developed or added to perfection, right? Well, what about the experience of what it felt like to suffer the pain of temptation? This is something Christ had never experienced before. So he must go through that to become that sympathetic high priest who could help us. That's Hebrews 2.10. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. So watch this. Through suffering, the perfect God became the perfect Savior. And God, in his wisdom, is using the temptation of Satan to accomplish this. So you have Satan trying to destroy Jesus, but we see God using that for Jesus' good, to perfect him to be the sympathetic high priest. And because of this, this verse can be written. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, now he understands what it feels like to be tempted, doesn't he? And he knows how to stand against it as a man using the same resources that are available to us. So because of this, scripture tells us when we're tempted, we need to run to him knowing he will sympathize. Why? Because he knows what it feels like. He knows what it's like and because he knows how to help. Now, that brings up another issue that is controversial, a matter the church has been arguing over ever since there's been a church. It says Christ was tempted, but is that really true? Was his temptation really like those we face? In other words, could he have fallen like we can? Now, some say no, because he didn't have a sinful nature, so there was no internal desire that would link to that external temptation and cause a fall. So while the devil could tempt, there was nothing in Christ that was attracted to it. But if that's true, was it really a temptation? And I think there's an answer for that. Now, you may not agree, but at least think about this. 
Adam was perfect and had no sinful nature, yet he fell, didn't he? But here's the thing. We can argue this matter until we're blue in the face, can't we? And believe me, the church has done that. But we're dealing in the realm of mystery here. One day it will all be clear. And I think we'll see we got some of these mysteries right and some we got really wrong. All I know is the Bible clearly states when Jesus dwelt on earth as a man, he was tempted in every way we are. So we've seen what God was doing during this time. He was using it to prove Jesus was the Messiah who would listen to his word and obey him, even in a time when it would be so easy to disobey. And he was using it to perfect Jesus to be that sympathetic Savior who could understand what we go through when we're tempted. But what was the devil trying to accomplish? Well, his goal was nothing less than the total destruction of God's redemptive plan. Now, we only have three of the temptations recorded, but the reality is Satan relentlessly attacked Jesus for 40 days, Mark 1.13, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And you know what Satan wanted? Here it is. He wanted just one sin, one slip up, just one. One sin would stop God's plan of redemption. Why? Well, one sin and Jesus is no longer the lamb without blemish. Therefore, he is no longer an acceptable sacrifice. One sin and he is no longer righteous. See, the righteousness that gets us into heaven is a 100% compliance to God's law. It's perfect obedience. Now, that is something we could never do on our own, right? But we become heaven ready when we trust Christ and are given his righteousness. See, he kept the law perfectly for us. That's Romans 5, 19. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. But if Jesus gives in to one temptation, just one, that verse is no longer true, is it? He is not righteous, and since he is the source of our righteousness, then neither are we. That means in this cosmic battle between God and Satan, Satan wins and we all end up in hell. But here's the thing. Here's the good news, the great news. Jesus never did fail. He never gave in once. He endured that relentless barrage for 40 days without failing. So the hope of heaven is still available for any who will repent of their sin and trust in him. Now, with that said, let's begin our look at the temptations to see what we can learn from them. And we're only going to see the first one today, and we're going to go into Matthew's fuller account for this. So let's look at the first temptation, and here it is. It's not trusting in the provision of God, or we could say as a subhead, taking matters into our own hands. Matthew 4, 1 through 2 says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now, fasting was a typical practice for the Jews in Jesus' day, and Jesus was probably doing this in preparation for the work he was called to do, the public ministry he had just entered into. And notice it says, after 40 days, he was hungry. Now, that's really important. Now, I've been told when you fast for an extended period, your hunger at one point, it's going to go away completely. But when it returns, it's essential that you eat, because at that point, you're beginning to starve to death. And if you don't provide nourishment, the body will begin to devour itself. It will start to eat its own organs. So this really ups the intensity of this first temptation, doesn't it? Satan is going to use this opportunity of weakness and legitimate need to tempt him with. Look at Matthew 4, 3. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now, if in the Greek can also be translated since, which is better here. I don't think Satan doubted Jesus was the Son of God. We see his demons using this title for him in Matthew 8. So here's the temptation. It's to misuse his power by stepping outside of God's will to meet his need. In other words, it is meeting a legitimate need he had in an illegitimate way. So Jesus responds in Matthew 4.4 4 by quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. Look at Matthew 4.4. 4. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So here's our first lesson. We are going to see that Jesus meets every temptation in this account with it is written. No arguing, no dialoguing, no binding or loosing, no casting the devil into the pit. Now, you know what? It's much simpler than that, yet much more effective. 
He simply replaces the lie of Satan with the truth of God. God said, that settles it. Now, to understand what he's saying, we need to see what the scripture he was quoting meant. Like I said, he's quoting from Deuteronomy 8, where you have Moses and the children of Israel in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 8, 2 and 3. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So God tested them in the wilderness to see if they would trust him and obey his commandments. Now get this, how did he test them? Well, he humbled them by letting them have legitimate needs, by letting them become hungry. That's what Jesus is going through, right? Now this test was meant to show them what was in their heart. God knew, but he wanted them to see. Would they trust him and still obey even when they were hungry? Or would they sin? Would they doubt God's promise and take matters into their own hands? Would they murmur and complain and even desire to go back to Egypt, which represented the world? So he tested them to show them their own hearts, to expose sin if necessary. Why? So they could deal with it. See, and God deals with us in the same way, doesn't he? He allows something to go wrong. He allows us to have a need. And the heat of that trial will cause sin that may be lurking in our heart to rise up to the surface. It might be anger, bitterness, or unbelief. Maybe it's a tendency to seek comfort by turning to illegitimate means. The testing lets us see the true condition of our heart, to see who we really are spiritually, so we can deal with those areas that are hindering us and come out purer and stronger. Also, when we pass the test, when it reveals nothing, you know what, that's going to really encourage us because we see growth, right? We see a greater faith. We think, wow, six months ago, I would have panicked. Now I'm resting in God. I'm growing. I passed the test. Isn't that great when that happens? So God tested them in the wilderness, but he also taught them. He used that time of testing to show them that they could depend upon him when they were needy, that they didn't have to panic. They didn't have to scheme and strive and take matters into their own hands. They had God's promises, and they learned that they could rely on those promises even when provision looked impossible, even if it meant God had to feed them by giving them manna from heaven. The food angels ate. I love Psalm 78, 25. Human beings ate the bread of angels. Wow, I'm looking forward to tasting manna in heaven, aren't you? I imagine it's wonderful. So Satan tempts Jesus, and can you imagine how powerful that temptation was, and even how reasonable and logical it might have sounded? Jesus, you're starving. That was true. And you must eat. Also true. So listen, the Father will understand if you use your miraculous powers to turn those stones into bread. Do you think he wants you to starve? Is he that mean? Is he that unloving? I mean, so much truth mixed in there. And it sounded so reasonable, didn't it? It's what is referred to as the Satan sausage, a thin outer skin that is true, that is meant to deceive you, but when you are drawn in or bite, to keep the analogy going, you find it is filled with lies. See, the truth attracts or deceives you, so you'll be willing to embrace the lies. And it would have been so easy to justify this, wouldn't it? Yeah, you know what, that's right, thanks. I'm starving and making food is just logical, just reasonable. So I think I will turn those stones into bread. Plus, we know producing food miraculously isn't inherently wrong, right? Jesus did it at least twice in the Gospels when he multiplied food to feed 4,000 men plus women and children, and then again for 5,000 men plus women and children. So he met those legitimate needs by miraculous means, and that was in the Father's will. That time. But this time, Jesus knew it wasn't. This act would indicate a lack of trusting God, trusting in his timing and in his way. So Jesus makes his stand, says, it is written. And don't miss what he's saying here. The lessons we need to learn by his example, I want to share two. First, obeying God is more important than eating bread, even when eating bread is necessary for survival. He wouldn't let his needs cause him to panic and doubt God. He knew the promises, and regardless of how dire the situation looked, 
he would continue to trust that the father saw what he was going through and would be true to his word. So he's hungry, starving, but he's still resting. The father's got this. As a man, he's passing the test. And I think we get a glimpse into how Jesus looked at life here. To him, the spiritual was far more satisfying than the physical. That was primary in his thinking. And he is our example, so we should model ourselves after him. We say, I want to be like Christ. But here we see what Christ was like. Andrew Murray said this, he, talking about Jesus, he refuses to turn stones into bread, not because he does not need it, nor because it is in itself evil, but because the hunger for bread is not the first necessity of man, as Satan would have us believe. Man shall not live by bread alone. So here is Jesus who is starving and needs to eat, saying what is truly satisfying is to live for the Father and be in his will. Even in this situation, being in his will is better than food. Wow. But you know what? Does he really mean this? Yes, there's an interesting passage in John 4 that shows this was true in Jesus' life. Jesus is on his way from Judea to Galilee, and he goes through Samaria when he stops in a town called Sychar, where it says Jacob's well was located. Now, we're told that Jesus was weary from the journey and was thirsty and hungry, so the disciples leave to go and get something for all of them to eat. But while Jesus is waiting, he meets a Samaritan woman and witnesses to her. She gets saved and goes to tell the people in the village that she came from. Now, the passage I want to point out occurs while she is gone. We pick up the story with the disciples returning with food and urging Jesus to eat. John 4, 31 through 33. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Now look at his response. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Then in verse 34, he tells them what that food is. John 4, 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. I love this. They say, Jesus, you need to eat. He says, I have. I have food you do not know about. In other words, the food you are offering can't satisfy like the food I just ate. I have feasted on the soul-satisfying spiritual nourishment of partaking in the Father's will. That was what he lived for. When he saw that woman saved, he felt like he had feasted. Ever been there? God uses you like that and the satisfaction, it's just off the charts, isn't it? I mean, there's nothing like it. Nothing the world can offer in the temporal realm that can compare. So Jesus says, the will of the Father is primary. The world can only offer snacks, but God provides a feast. But you know what? Words can be cheap, right? It's easy to talk about how sold out you are. I've seen it many times. I've done it many times. Talking a good spiritual game, but not living those words out. See, it's easy to want the applause of men without paying the cost of following God. But was Jesus like that? When he says God's will was primary, I choose that over everything else, did he mean it? Well, yeah. I mean, just take a trip into the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he's crucified, where the stress is unbearable, so intense, it's pushing blood out through his pores. Can you imagine the temptation there, what Satan was suggesting? At this point, he had already offered Jesus the kingdoms of the world if he would bypass the cross and worship him. Now, as the stress is off the charts, can't you hear the hissing of the serpent there in the garden? Jesus, hey, the offer still stands. Look at you, so stressed, your skin is soaked in blood. You're a mess. Why go through this when you don't have to? Be reasonable, accept my offer. But what does Jesus do? Look at Mark 14, 34 through 36 to get the picture here. And he said to them, that's the disciples who were with him, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. In this hour of his greatest testing, in this hour of unbearable stress, he chose to do the Father's will. So in the wilderness, he's facing starvation, yet he refuses to step out of God's will to provide food. 
at the Samaritan well. He informs his disciples, doing God's will is like feasting to him. That's what provides his greatest satisfaction. Then in the garden, we see this is not just cheap talk. When facing the torment of the cross, when undergoing such stress that blood is being pushed through his pores, still he says, thy will be done. I choose your will over mine. And he gets up off his knees and marches to the soldiers who had come to arrest him. He suffers a mock trial and then goes to the cross to satisfy God's justice against sin, not his sin, but ours. He hung on that cross so you and I could have a way to be forgiven. Kent Hughes said this, In the greatest display of obedience that will ever be known, Jesus took the full chalice of man's sin and God's wrath, looked shuddering deep into its depth, and in a still act of his will, drank it all. Well, let's close now with some practical application. First, how did Jesus stand against the devil's lies? Well, he quoted truth. No dialogue, no arguing, no magical prayer we just discovered, no binding the devil, nothing fancy, just the simplicity of biblical truth that replaced the lie. And this emphasizes the necessity of knowing Scripture well enough to be able to use it. See, the Scriptures are not just meant to be printed on beautiful plaques to be put up on our walls or on our coffee cups. The scriptures are provided as spiritual armor that is meant to be used in combat. They're meant to be bloodied up as we hack down those giants that face us, the giants of panic and doubt and lust and whatever it is. They're meant to cut down the devil's lies. Timothy Keller said this, When we hide God's word in our hearts, it becomes a powerful weapon against the enemy. Scripture is our defense against temptation, providing clarity, strength, and guidance to overcome the lies and enticements of Satan. See, Scripture is a mighty weapon forged in heaven and provided by our Father to expose the devil's schemes and empower us to stand against the temptations he brings. Well, all right, guys, as I was editing the video today, I thought of a couple practical applications that I thought might help. And so I thought I would jump in here to show you how this might look in our lives, how the devil may try to convince us to take matters into our own hands when we feel we have needs. And let's start with a matter that is really hurting the church. And I'm only going to do a couple of these because of time constraints, but it would be sexual sin. See, the devil will argue, why did God give you a sex drive if you can't use it? Doesn't seem fair, does it? And he will try to convince those who are single that it's okay to have sex outside of marriage. You know what? Hey, everybody's doing it, right? I mean, he's trying to convince us we don't have to wait on God and his way. We can go our own way. Now, how do we answer that? Well, it's the same as Jesus did. Thus saith the Lord. The Bible is very clear about fornicators and the sexually immoral. God says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what God says, and so we stand against the lie with the truth. We don't live according to our own feelings and our own emotions and even our own what we feel we need. The Word of God is our guide, the final authority in how we live our life. We've got to be very careful that we don't end up meeting legitimate needs in an illegitimate way. That's what was happening with Jesus, isn't it? Now, what about the sin of materialism? Another problem that is so rampant in the church today. See, Satan wants us to be covetous. He wants us to need, need, need. Then rather than praying to see if God wants us to have those things, instead of waiting on his provision, we're tempted to take matters into our own hands, to get what we want now instead of trusting God and waiting on him. So we go and we take out loans that we can't afford to get things we don't really need. And we end up bringing ourselves under bondage to the lender, don't we? We lose our joy and life becomes nothing more than a burden. And it gets in the way of our spiritual growth. I mean, instead of committing ourselves to the church to serve God, we work overtime instead to pay bills and we can't go to church. We just did what we wanted to do and we got burnt. Now, the answer to materialism is what we saw in this study. True contentment only comes when we put God first. Scripture says, drink from this world and you will thirst again. Scripture also warns us to guard our hearts from idols. And it says that covetousness is a form of idolatry. 
We could go on and on with this, but time just doesn't permit. But there is temptations to become angry, and bitter, to stir up trouble in church. There's a multitude of ways the devil tempts us to step outside of God's will, and he's very good at justifying that in our mind, rationalizing that in our thinking. But the answer is always to stand against all of that with a thus says the Lord. We use scriptures to stand against the lies and defeat the temptations. Well, okay, back to the study. Second, we see the source of true satisfaction. It's not found in the temporal, in what the world can offer. Jesus clarifies it. It's in the spiritual realm. The world offers snacks, God offers feast. And the older I get, the more the snacks of the world look like junk food. Third, we learn about trusting God for his provision, that we are to rest in the truth, that in his way and in his timing, he will provide like he promised he would. See, as believers, we base our lives on the promises given to us and the faithfulness of God to keep those promises, right? But the devil tempts us to panic, to scheme and manipulate, to take matters into our own hands, striving in our own ways to provide what God has already promised to give us. See, God has designed Christianity so it is based on his faithfulness. And he will bring situations into our life that test us, that force us to choose. Will we pass the test and trust God in this, or will we panic? Will we head back to the world and do things we know we shouldn't to try to remove the pressure? Will we grumble and complain? Will we get bitter and angry? Or will we pass the test by trusting God? And let me encourage you, as we do pass those tests, we will see God move in a way that develops a growing dependence and faith on him. So Jesus is teaching us by example how to fight in the spiritual realm. It is by knowing, trusting, and using the word of God. The truth will set us free from those lies the devil uses in temptation. And Jesus is teaching us by example how to be content in this life. It is by putting God and his will above everything else. Paul says in Romans 12 too, that his will is good, pleasing, and perfect. And friends, the more we can honestly say, thy will be done, the better off we will be. Billy Graham said this, saying thy will be done is a prayer of surrender and trust. It is a recognition that God's will is perfect and our greatest joy and fulfillment comes from aligning ourselves with his plans and purposes. To honestly be able to say thy will be done, to really relinquish control, you know what, it can seem a bit scary, can it? And I get that. But here's what it does. It will open the door for God's joy, peace, and blessing to flood into our life. Matthew 6, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So the first temptation is to try and meet legitimate needs in illegitimate ways. Jesus met those lies with truth and chose to align himself with the Father, to trust him implicitly in his way and in his timing. Well, all right, guys, that's all I got. Thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you for praying for me. And for those of you who support the channel, thank you for that. Brothers and sisters, let's get the truth of God out in a world that is pushing it away. Well, God bless you guys. I love you, and I will see you in the next video.